Bueno, sin más preámbulo con ustedes, Pacha Adams. Buenas tardes. Tardes. All right. Thank you for having me. Before I begin speaking, I tell all of my audiences that I answer all my mail. I've never used a computer. I don't know how to use a computer. I don't know how to get to our website. But I know you do. And my address is at patchadams.org. I hand write four to six hundred letters every month. I'm caught up. So if you need a friend, if you're wrestling with something in life, you have great ideas for a healthier world, want a good recommendation for a book, write me. I will answer you right away. The most important thing is a clear return address. That's the most helpful. I have been invited here this afternoon to speak about the connection between humor and health. I know doctors like data. Not that they have data for a lot of things, but there's an illusion of data. Is there anyone in the room that needs scientific proof that humor is good for your health? That you need scientific proof? because your life is the laboratory. You're old enough to have already found out that humor is important. I'm going to say something about the research, which is boring, and I will say something about the relationship between humor and the health of an individual, how it saved my life, humor and the health of a group of people talking about its value in our hospital, and humor and the health of the whole world trying to move towards a world of peace and justice. <clears throat> I will show a film and have time for questions, I hope. How the research. I, I wish I was a scientist studying humor, lab coat, a white lab coat, and I'm there trying to determine was that a real laugh or a fake laugh? <laughs> kind of the Japanese laugh, or the noisy barroom laugh. <laughs> and are they different, and how long, and what was the... Ah. But they do study it, and they say that with laughter there is an increased secretion of endorphins, which is why you feel good and uh, an increased secretion of catecholamines, which is why you feel peppy, hard to fall asleep laughing. <laughs> Not even the narcoleptics fall asleep laughing. And a decrease of the sed lowering of the sed rate, lowering the cortisol, increased secretion of all the immunoglobulins, so it's a stimulant of the immune system. And if you go out in primary care, you will see patients whose lives are jolly need a doctor differently than the patients whose lives are struggle. Uh, there's a lot more research, but I really practically fall asleep when I think about it, because no one is laughing for endorphins, you know. Think I could use some catecholamines. <laughs> the psychosocial research is, in a way, more interesting. No matter what I tell a journalist all over the world, no matter what I say, the article in the newspaper will say, Patch Adams says, laughter is the best medicine. I've never said it. I think you know that friendship is the best medicine, that our relationship with our friends is our most powerful source of health. And humor, laughter, is a good grease, but still it owns the language. 
In English, we call the person who brings humor to a social situation the life of the party. Not even the good time, the life, oxygen and water. Not the beautiful person or the rich person or the person who throws the party. The person who brings humor and play is the life of the party, which is a huge, uh, a huge statement. Certainly, it can give you an idea that if you want to be popular, be funny. People love to have that funny person around, I promise you. I have a lot of personal experience. And, you know, there, there's so many different ways. I guess people need to, if you get a degree in science, you need to study something. And they're studying so many aspects of, of humor. But I'm going to stop there because you don't need actually any more notes. Everything is fine. The rest of this is uh, life story. The value of humor in the health of an individual. I'm 65 years old. I grew up outside of the United States on military basis because my country loves war. <laughs> and I grew up the first 16 years of my life on military basis. And my father died from war when I was 16. It broke my heart. We moved back to the United States in 1961 to the southern states, which at that time in our history, black people did not have the right to use a white person's bathroom. And yet they call the United States the land of the free. What a bunch of crap. <laughs> Pardon me. And I, I lost it. Everything that I grew up thinking was real, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, everything about the religions that I heard growing up I saw was all garbage. That in my nation, a black person, because of the color of their skin, couldn't use a toilet, a drinking fountain, a restaurant, a hotel. And I wept. I cried. I cried. And if you saw the Patch Adams movie, it starts with me in a mental hospital. They couldn't make Robin Williams look 17. <laughs> so they quote Dante in his midlife crisis to give an idea that he went to medical, I went to medical school as a middle-aged person, which is not true. I was hospitalized three times in one year, 17 and 18, trying to kill myself. I didn't want to live in a world of violence and injustice. I actually was a happy kid. You know, happy, happy, happy. My father died, and even more than my father dying, because it's the military, you imagine this is going to happen. But the idea that our country denied rights to a sizable portion of our population just uh, nearly killed me. I was placed on a lot of medication, which I hated. And in the last hospitalization, <laughs> lightning struck. Dummy, you don't kill yourself, you make revolution. All right. <laughs> a revolution for loving all people. And because my mother gave me self-esteem, as soon as I decided I wanted to do something, I didn't have to develop. I knew I could do it. I made two decisions that changed my life forever. One was to serve humanity and medicine in a country that does not take care of their poor people. I said I would be a free doctor. So for 40 years, I've never made any money as a doctor. Always free. The other decision was much more personal. How can I be an instrument for peace and justice and care all the time? Wake up, I'm ready. And that's when I decided to be happy every day, all day long, the rest of my life. And for 47 years, I've been uninterruptedly happy. You know, hard to be with if you want to be miserable. I, in deciding to be happy, 
it was quick that I realized that deciding to be happy really was deciding to be six things. Happy, funny, loving, cooperative, creative, and thoughtful. That it was really the decision to be those things in my life. And I, I was already a silly person because I found, I didn't, I don't know about you men, but when I was growing up, there was no way that men were behaving that I wanted to be. I never liked fighting. I've never hit back. I didn't like sports because I, all the messages around winning and competition and power over, you know, I wanted to do what the girls were doing. <laughs> and so I found out that, you know, there are a lot of bullies, especially a lot of bullies on military bases. And I found out that if I make the bullies laugh, they won't hit me. So I became the funny guy. <laughs> make a fool of myself, they won't hit me. And so when I decided to be happy and decided to live funny, I went out there it was at a time in my life, 18, when I had no success in dating, and I didn't have to study. I'm one of these people, in medical school, I took 17 pages of notes. I just am not a person that has to study very much. So I had all this free time. Woo! So I went out to love people. I, I spent two hours a day for two years, every day, almost like a scientist, calling up wrong numbers on the phone to practice talking with people. Can I find a tone, a timbre, a subject matter that would make them want to stay on the phone with me? And for how long? And I got really good. I still love to do that. <laughs> and I spent 10 hours a week going up and down elevators. I, I lived in the Washington area, lots of tall buildings. Because once that door of the elevator shuts, there they are, your people. And they can't escape. <laughs> so I started to be silly on elevators. I can even, can you come up here? I can demonstrate something. Yes. Yes, that's right. All right. Give him some encouragement. Okay, let's say this is a normal man on an elevator. Okay, hypothetical situation. <laughs> now, an elevator is an interesting place. There are no rules except weight. You know, how many kilos? But no one goes on an elevator going, okay, um, 60 kilos. Uh, <laughs> A 50, 100, 100 kilos, 175 kilos. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, but no one ever actually thinks about how much weight, even though that's the only rule. But everyone normally, adult, they get on, they might look briefly at the person, turn around, show them their culo. <laughs> put the arms at the side and say nothing. It's not a rule, but everywhere in the world this is kind of how people are. Now I started these experiments and this was the simplest one. The door would open and I would do this. <laughs> Notice I'm not touching. And uh, just the human tension that would arise in this was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I started to wear costumes. I started to play with people. I, I mean, I, I, w I wasn't like doing it on a good day. I was doing it all day long, everywhere. To where now, I'm, I'm very directed in it. It's, it's uh, my life. I wear clown clothes, for example, and. This may look like they're not clown clothes, but uh, let me show you an example, okay, of something I can do with my pants. <laughs> A nice little skirt. <laughs> and, 
and I like to do that. <laughs> but much more troubling to the society is when I go to position number three. <laughs> you know, I don't actually have to tell a joke. <laughs> if I just stand there, people are laughing. And if you know something about humor, a joke, uh, humor is about normal and a surprise. So with a joke, it's normal words, normal words, surprise, ha-ha. And physical comedy is just looking different than normal. So I don't have to do anything. Tomorrow when I go home in the airport in Mexico City, I just have to stand next to somebody. <laughs> and it creates something. <laughs> Sometimes it creates this. <laughs> and of course, I follow suit. <laughs> and I just was playing with people, and I played with people, and in the 47 years since I started doing it, I haven't been sick at all. Humor saved my life. Other things did. I have a regular strenuous exercise program. I have no bad thoughts and uh, the other things. But I know that playing with the world has made my life. It doesn't mean I'm not serious. You know, if you talk with me as the uh, residents did that picked me up at the airport, I'm concerned about human extinction. And that's funny to the animals. You know, they're going, they've got paradise and they're destroying it? Ha ah, ah, ha, they think they're smart. <laughs> but uh, it's really made my life. I, I've been goofy all my adult life. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples. Let me, you know, I travel 300 days a year for 27 years, so I'm always traveling somewhere. And let's say you're at the airport and the the airport uh, says, your plane has been delayed four hours. Now that's a Prozac moment. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be late for my meeting. I'm going to be late for my girlfriend. I'm, I'm going to be late. Life is horrible. I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> Take a tablet, right. <laughs> or, you can reach into your travel bag and get your caca. <laughs> one pile of caca costs about the same as one psychiatric medication tablet. <laughs> and it's reusable. <laughs> so, instead of going and having a horrible experience, because when they delay your flight, you can think, oh, they're saving my life, which should be a good thought. They don't want me to go up in a bad airplane. Good. Thank you, instead of, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> Get your caca. <laughs> and this is public health, right? This is a public health service. You look where people are walking, and you set your caca down, <laughs> and you just go back like this. <laughs> and no matter how athletic you are, you can win the gymnastic all-around gold medal. But when you're walking along and your foot is lifted over said pile, you're dancing. And in the course of four hour delay, you're gonna see some choreography. <laughs> and, you know, people are beautiful. If you aren't in love with watching people, you're missing one of life's great treasures. Because everyone is different and yet you can see patterns. One of the ones I like is that they're walking along and they do their dance. But it's not over. They'll often take one, two steps and look back. One, two. 
and if you're really lucky, like skimming stones, you'll get a third one where they look bad. I've, I've seen people, many times actually, where they, they also are delayed, and they know that somebody put that caca there. <laughs> so they have their little experience, and then they look around, and then they see my face, and I do this. <laughs> and they sit down, and they start watching. I think I've had as many as 40 watchers. People who just want to see what happens. And the only difference between me and people who aren't funny is I do it. I carry it with me. It's also good at a wedding reception. <laughs> you go to the toss salad on the table and just slip it under, you know, with, slip it underneath there. Non-toxic. <laughs> and I, uh, I love to do that. I've clowned every day for 47 years. It's, uh, it's given me my life with my partner. It's given me a relationship with my children, both who are adults and work with me. It's made everything better in my life. And it's also, I think, brought me good health. So it's good for you. By the way, it should be interesting since you want data. And in medicine, they're always telling medical students and residents, you must look professional. No funny business. But the truth is, nowhere in the history of science is there one single paper showing the value ever to being serious. Okay, there's no reason there's no data for you to ever be serious. There's no data for you to ever be indifferent, impersonal, apathetic, mean, rude, hierarchical. None of those are ever good for people. And there's thousands of papers saying being loving, being funny, being joyful is good for people. So if you get in trouble sometimes for being a doctor who may not be professional enough, go to the literature. You will win the argument. So be funny. Now I want to say something about the hospital model that I'm, I started 40 years ago. I entered medical school in 1967 to use it as a vehicle for social change. I am an activist. I didn't have to study very much, and what I was interested in, I could already tell that healthcare delivery in the United States was horrible. There were many, many horrible things. The way it is delivered, you understand. It's very hierarchical. All over the country, doctors are rude, rude to nurses, rude to nursing stations, just rude, nasty, arrogant. It's in fact, I correspond with 140 countries. Is anything wrong? Nope. Am I hurting? Ah, liquid. That's good. Was I sounding dry? <laughs> well, I'll take some water. So in my senior year in medical school, I wrote up a paper describing a hospital that I've worked now on for 40 years. The idea was to look at for the four years I was in medical school, research healthcare delivery systems, historically around the world, with the idea to make a hospital that took every single concern with the way healthcare was delivered and give an answer. And so I started in March of 71, the Gesundheit Institute. Now, when I graduated in 1971, no one said, oh, here's a hospital. <laughs> nice doctor. So we didn't have a hospital, so we had to invent one. And if you've been to poor countries, areas where they deal with people, we did what they do. We got a large communal home and said we were a hospital. 20 adults and our children, three of us were physicians, moved into a large six-bedroom house and said we were a hospital. We were open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for all manner of medical problems from birth to death. 
In the 12 years we operated, we had 500 to 1,000 people in our home each month, with 5 to 50 overnight guests a night. Now, I know you can do the math, six bedroom house, 20 adults and their children already living there, five to 50 overnight guests a night. Let's just say it was intimate. <laughs> if you realize that most of the people that came were anxious, lonely, 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 lonely. If you read American literature, that they're describing how they were. Lonely, bored, frightened, and uh, this was our this was our home. There was no break. We lived there, 24/7, with this kind of intensity. Of the 15,000 people who came to our home in that period of time, 3,000 had profound mental health histories, and we made a decision to never give any psychiatric medicine. We said, let's try mental health. And so people were insane in our home all the time. At times they were dangerous. My closest friend in medical school was murdered by one of our patients. We let everyone come in our home. Our idea was to eliminate the idea of debt in the medical interaction. Not only we were free, but we didn't want you to think you owed anything. No bartering. You got care because you belonged to community. That was our politics. We never wanted you to think you owed something, but be excited you belonged to something. In that same emphasis, we, uh, we never had anything to do with health insurance because in the United States, health insurance companies control how care is delivered. What is delivered and how it's delivered? It's a horrible, horrible system in the United States. And all you have to free yourself up from it is don't do it. No government or private insurance. The thing that is most radical to a conservative mind is that we're the only medical group in the United States refusing to carry malpractice insurance. For example, some doctors pay more than $100,000 a year just in malpractice insurance. But we say we need the freedom to make a mistake. Medicine is all about mistakes. We know we can care 100% of the time. We know we can never promise cure. And so we should be humble, and if we make a mistake, to do the best we can to correct the mistake, but not be sued. And one of the global issues around problems in healthcare is everywhere people are screaming for more time with a patient. The staff for more time, and the patient and their families for more time. So I'm a family doctor, and my first interview with a new patient is four hours long. You can imagine what that must be like. I ask every question sensitive to life. I probe you more than anyone has ever probed you. And if I see any weird squiggly lines, I probe further. I insisted that I made a house call, so I went to every home of a patient, invited myself to dinner, played with the children in their room so that we could have a relationship exclusive of the parents. And uh, that I could know, begin to know who these people were, and they can begin to know who I am since they live in our home. We've also been the only hospital to integrate all of the healing arts in the United States. Acupuncture, homeopathy, naturopathy, chiropractic, Ayurvedic, anthroposophic, herbal medicine, body work, faith healing were all part of our practice. Even though early on it was against the law. We didn't care about the law. It's bad law. We also insisted on educating our patients since what, you know, as soon as you have a long interview with a patient, you realize that their health is related to their education, related to the politics where they live. It's related to the environment. It's related to the social situation. So since the citizens of the United States are ignorant in these areas in most cases, we educated people on, as you study in medical school, organ systems, we 
educated people on political, social, economic, environmental, and educational systems, on what they were and what it meant and what participation meant. We did this work for 12 years and nobody, nobody gave us a single donation. I had 1,400 foundation rejections, even though we'd been the only model in the country addressing the problems of care delivery. We had a model that eliminates 90% of the cost of care in a modern American hospital. The major way we do that is through salaries. Because we wanted to eliminate hierarchy in the practice of medicine so that no one had power over another person, at our hospital, everyone makes the same salary. Cleaning person and the surgeon, $300 a month. And they live on the land as a communal eco-village to show a way that people could live that's so much cheaper and so much more human than the unnatural way of nuclear family, which, as you know, is not natural for us primates. Natural is tribal. We have been tribal people for a hundred million years. And I think we all know that nuclear family is failing globally as an institution. So, our, and here's a point about humor. We made no money. So, all of the staff had to work outside jobs and then give all their money to work. So we, for 40 years, I have paid to be a doctor. I pay to be a doctor. And I say that without any sense of sacrifice or long and hard journey. Rather to say the unencumbered practice of care is an ecstatic experience worth paying to do. Harder than giving up money for people, I think a lot of times, is giving up privacy. We never, ever had any privacy. Bedrooms weren't private. Bathrooms weren't private. Normal poor people. And uh, so they made no money. They paid to work there. They had <laughs> no free time, no privacy, and their house was full of needy, lonely people. Nobody left the first nine years. Why? I think clearly the reason is why is that we were the first silly hospital in history. We made everything funny. We made living funny and we made dying funny. If you only have one week to live, I'm your man. <laughs> I am fun to die with. And you think about it, okay, we all die, right? Everyone's dying? Good. Raise your hand if you would like it to be fun. Raise your hand so people can see that it's the vast majority want a fun one. If there's a hospital administrator here, think about a program. <laughs> Since we never gave psychiatric medicine to children or adults, you can say that we were a very silly mental hospital as well. For example, we did barf alongs with bulimics. <laughs> if the interpreter is having trouble translating that. <laughs> Meaning, way back 40 years ago when bulimia was called anorexia nervosa, it was very isolating. It was not uh, in the media and these people were often put in mental hospitals for long periods of time when this was not what they needed really and so we were trying to help them come out of the closet if you would so that we would throw up with them and say hey throwing up cool <laughs> as you know a lot of times if you do the thing of the person you're with you bond with them in a special way if they like a particular sport, if they like a particular dance, and you do it with them, you connect with them, and that's what we did. The humor part of our practice, if you saw the Patch Adams movie, everything in there is small relative to what really happened. We were extravagant with play all of the time. 
it was again how a lot of how we made it fun to work all the time. Wow, so I'm saying that humor helps a group of people. And if you've ever tried to do a group event, be funny. More people will come to the meeting. Especially if you're an activist or if you're in part of a team in your residency or something, try to make it fun. The relaxation factor will be so much easier and you know, I don't have anything good to say about psychiatric medication. They lie, they cause permanent brain damage, and no one should be placed on them. Certainly in the long term. I'm very proud I've never given one as a family doctor. Okay, humor and the health of a whole group of people. The world, society. Before I say something, I want to ask you a question. Raise your hand if you're profoundly concerned about the future of humanity. Raise it high so we can see, again, that it's most everybody. Okay, what does that sentence mean? What is the important word in that sentence? The important word is profoundly. It's easy to say I'm concerned. Because you can say, oh yeah, I'm concerned, la la. <laughs> but when you add the word profoundly, you're no longer casual about it. So I want to tell you what I mean by profoundly. I'm profoundly concerned because my library of 35,000 books and the 120 monthly magazines I take and my lifetime of study I don't see any trend that gives me an idea that we will not be extinct by the end of this century. I think biologically we could find out as early as the 20s or 30s that we're no longer viable as a species. That's what I mean by profoundly. I don't see any trend. I go all over the world. I know many great activist organizations. But I don't see a trend. There's not a government on this planet I respect, not one. If you study the health of the world with the same diligence you've studied the health of a child, you would agree with me. For example, I've read 2,000 books on the environment because I don't want to say these statements lightly. So given this profound concern, how can we as doctors ignore that statement and the implications of what must change in order for that statement to no longer be true? And humor has been a great tool for us in that work. I'll give you an idea. Uh, a, a little problem. In the United States, there's a lot of public verbal and physical violence. Okay, it's hard to walk around there without seeing someone doing something on a shopping mall or, or at least parent to child. Nastiness, yelling and screaming, there's a lot of it in the public and everybody kind of goes, okay. And Many years ago, I said, what can I do? What, what can I do, especially about public physical violence? You turn the aisle in a grocery store, you see a parent and child fighting. Now you're a pediatrician. What do you do? What is, the, what is a possible procedure that can stop that violence and be a win-win for both the adult and the child? And I'm going to show you what has worked for me in 30 years. Because 30 years ago I said, okay, I'm going to be a weird superhero. I'm not going to learn karate. Hiya! Stop the fight. I'm going to be too strange to keep fighting. So if I normally walk in there with my pants down, my legs down, and I see something, I back up and pull up my pants. <laughs> now, I'm not 
importantly, this is all toys. You'll notice my pockets are very deep. And in both pockets, they're full of toys, fun, equipment, or technology, if you would, or <laughs> medical instruments public health instruments. So normally for many years, I would reach in this pocket and I'd pull out a nose, put it on, and 100% of the time in 30 years, it stopped the fight. I estimate it's over 7,000 fights. In bars, it doesn't matter. That it was just, you know, as with all medicine in dealing with a problem, you, you try to understand the problem and what can you do? This has worked for me 100% of the time, and I don't like seeing any violence. I particularly don't like seeing an adult smash a child. Now, two years ago, I want to show you new technology. I'm very proud of this, discovering this technology. That uh, I used to use a nose instead, but now I use the triple threat. It sounds more dangerous, right? <laughs> And my first, triple means three, and the first piece of equipment came from dentists. <laughs> what is a beautiful and important instrument for them <laughs> Now normally this would be enough to stop a fight, right? I mean, you're going to forget what you were fighting about. Huh? You turn the corner, you look up at this guy doing that. But, you know, if one bit of technology works, two more bits might be helpful. Ah, sure. Notice it fits right in your pocket right here. Uh-huh. Number two. Is is very dog teeth <laughs> to add to the closure of the experience. And number three, one moment, please. Noco. <laughs> no. You understand how they don't keep fighting. Because this is coming at them. And they can't concentrate on hurting somebody. So, remember the triple threat? Oh, yeah. And the question. The question to a doctor is, the next time you see public violence and you don't have equipment, <laughs> ask yourself if you wish you had equipment. <laughs> so that's a little microcosm if you want to do something against violence. What else is possible? We closed our doors. 1984 and said until we can't do our work until we have an actual hospital that we learned a lot in this very primitive frontier style but it wasn't a model no one's going to copy what we're doing or be stimulated they loved it medical students doctors nurses came from all over the world and they loved being there but they couldn't conceive of going home and trying their own experiments so we needed a real hospital and we could see if we kept working, we weren't going to raise the money. So we had refused publicity, and then we allowed publicity. And as soon as we allowed publicity, we had to close our doors because, you know, 40 million Americans need a place like ours. And we didn't even have beds to offer them. So we closed our doors and became fundraisers. But you can't just be fundraisers. With the publicity, I started to be asked to speak. So I've been on the road now 27 years, mostly 300 days a year. So it's been decades since I've been more than two weeks in one place. And it was also during this time in 1985 that we said, let's 
we've got to do something else for the global situation. And we're a very poor organization, and we said, well, let's work for peace. And the idea at that time was to go love the enemy. It's an ancient idea. Love the enemy. And the enemy at that time, very noisy enemy because of Ronald Reagan, was the Soviet Union. So we started our clown trips to Russia. Every November, this will be the 27th year, we take 40 people. We've taken ages 3 to 88, which is very inclusive. We don't require any training. You could be the dulling, dullest, most boring person in Mexico, and you would make a great clown. We don't screen anybody. We do 10 to 16 hours a day of clowning in hospitals, orphanages, prisons, nursing homes, restaurants, subways, hotels. Nobody is safe. We invade. And I want to tell you one thing that happened that was very powerful, and that is, you know, if you are raised, and I'm sure the same is true if you're raised in these hospitals that you've, you've been training in, that you would never, you have pain medicine, your pharmacy has pain medicine. If a child has bone metastases and is screaming, you're going to help them. But Russia was the first time I went in a hospital with no pain medicine. And then what do you do? See, the thing is, if you're so dependent on your instruments and your pharmacy, you're still a doctor, you understand? If you have nothing, you're still a doctor. And I remember the first time I, I walked into the room of a child who had severe bone metastases. Maybe all bone metastases are severe. And his mother was sitting there, and the story was the child had not stopped screaming in five months. It would scream, 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 get exhausted, fall asleep, and as soon as the exhaustion wore off, would wake up screaming. There was no relief in five months. And I had never been in this kind of situation because no one would ever do it intentionally. And I walked in the room thinking nothing would happen, and the child was silent for an hour. We clowned for an hour, he was silent. It was, felt like a miracle. You know, a miracle is just surprise. And as much as I was glad the child was not screaming, the look on the mother's face of the child not screaming, it's right here, even though it happened 26 years ago. It was the first time. It's been many, many hundreds and hundreds of times since then. So this was a huge thing to see a value in relieving suffering that I had no idea was available in humor, play, love. I really see humor clowning simply as a trick to get love close. I have a lot more ease of invasibility invading you if I'm a clown than if I am dressed in a boring gray suit. This led to us 20 years ago. We were so unhappy in Russia with the orphans' work that's nightmarish, so we started to take care of our own children and take care of 400 children in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Then we said, hell, let's take clowns into war. And three times we've gone right into war with, uh, with clowns. And then countless refugee camps. We were in Sri Lanka right after the tsunami. We were in Haiti in March this year, last year. I estimate that I've been at 10,000 deathbeds as a clown. I've seen a huge amount of suffering. And this work in the world has led us to build clinics and schools in poor countries. Now clowns are going in hospitals in 120 countries. In some countries, many, many clown groups exist. And we know that this uh, sprang from our work. And so even on the situation, also trying to teach activists, a lot of them burning out, a lot of people wanting to change the world, but it's difficult or hard. And that with play, you can work harder and longer and love every minute of it. 
What I'd like to do is to show you a film. I wondered, I have a lot of different films I could show you, but this is a new one, and I'm showing it partly because you're physicians, and I'm curious because uh, how many of you have made a house call? Not too many. So you can actually finish your residency in medicine and never have made a house call, where in most of medicine's history, house call was our life. Uh, you may or may not know this, until 1920, only poor people went to hospitals. They were considered death traps. And as they became a lot more fancy and expensive, then in the US, only rich people went to hospitals. So house call is an old thing. And I want to show you a house call. If I didn't tell you it was a house call, you would think it was a clown visit. So I'm going to tell you the story. You know, it's against the law for people from the United States to go to Cuba. And as an activist, I break the law a lot of times. And so I've been to Cuba many times. And every time we go there, we are hosted by their national children's theater called La Colmanita, Little Bees. And the head of this is a magnificent man, just a, a wonderful, talented person, a, a great human being. And a couple of years ago, he came to me, we were on a, a tour, and he said, Patch, the most important person in my life, my grandmother, has been diagnosed with cancer and she's going to die, it's inoperable. Would you come and visit her? You know, in modern medicine, you think, well, hell, if there's nothing I can do, why would I visit her? Of course, that was after medicine. You see, medicine, we didn't used to have a lot of great things or arrogance around the things we had. And we had humility, and we made a house call to hold a hand, to sit with people, have dinner, enjoy. And so you can wonder, what would I do if somebody asked me as a doctor to make a house call on an older woman who is dying of cancer. Uh, you don't know them. In my case, my Spanish is limited to tiquero and amiga. <laughs> and gracias. So, good words, but not exactly a conversation. So I want you to see and try to imagine what you might have done. Because what was he asking me? What was this man asking me? I'm, I'm thinking my own thoughts. What was he asking me? What value can I be? First, I can be a value to him because I could see he was weeping over the loss of his grandmother. And if you've had a close grandmother, you know what that means. And that, so my first knowledge was I was visiting her for him. He would be there, he would see something that he liked seeing and being a part of. And then there was also, I didn't know her, I didn't know how she was tr dealing with this diagnosis. A lot of people don't deal with it very well. If you actually didn't know this information, you would not tell from the movie that she has cancer. So can we turn off the lights? I might say a few things. I'm thrilled to say on this trip was my brother. So in this room of this tiny little house of this woman is my brother, who should be obvious to you. My oldest son, who is filming, he's now 34. And the doctor that is my closest friend, John, who's been with me 37 years. So not only was it a thrill to do this for Tan and for his grandmother and for their family, but to do it with my family was really sweet. You might ask yourself, what is he talking about a house call? No medicine happened. 
Ta-da! Ta-da! Are we optimistic? We are optimistic. Great. Okay, we have to watch a little bit. This is unedited footage. I apologize. You may not know this. Cuba is 85% organic farming. No other country in the world even can imagine this. This is not the house call. <laughs> this is fun going to the house call. My brother, Hermano. <laughs> I want you to picture yourself doing this. again.
exactly the right view to see us. <laughs> stop here if you if we went all the way to the end you would see that there are nine members of her family in the room three generations all that came in on this celebration so I think we can stop it I, I, I hope you really hear me this is a house call that it may be hard to see a medicine you were trained to do in what I was doing. But what can I do for her inoperable cancer? That's one part of doctoring. Another part of doctoring is her family and herself. And that's what we were working on. Well, why don't I throw it open for questions? Are you nosy? You can be completely free to ask me any question you desire. If you don't speak English, I, my Spanish is very limited, and I don't see the little translator's headphones for me, but we will work it out. Feel free to be as nosy as you dare. I have no privacy. All right. Don't all ask questions at the same time. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. When someone is dying near to you, no, no, no. Child, how do you manage to to smile for him or to or to come for him? How or did you? Okay. You know she's dying, right? This woman is dying. It's hard to know that she has terminal cancer and that her whole family is greatly unhappy.
I mean, I think when you go into medicine, life and death invite you to see them as normal processes. Are you hearing voices also? But when you when you choose to be a doctor, intoxication. Unless you, I mean, maybe not in dermatology, but you're going to see a lot of life and death. And in pediatrics, you're going to see the worst kind: children dying. You know, there's no greater tragedy for a loving parent than the loss of their child. And children often die very tragically, very painfully. And it is interesting. I don't know of any medical schools that give a training in dealing with this. It might interest you. No medical school in the world teaches compassion. We are now trying to start a global initiative. And you can see on our website, we're starting to put papers up about exploring compassion for several years and then create a syllabus for the teaching of compassion every year in medical school as a thread that runs through the entire course. You know, the question you asked was, I think, specifically about me. How do I deal with it? And I, I've been to huge amounts of suffering. You know, I've held 2,000 children dying of starvation in my arms. I will connect it back to what I said, what happened when I was 18, when I decided that I was going to make myself a revolutionary and I was going to be happy all of the time. Are they for us? Are they on our team? Good. So, in a way, the answer to your question ties into the answer how I decided and then made myself happy all the time. A very key for me was that my mother gave me self-esteem. I love me. And my, it's just normal for me, good health. You love yourself. In the four-hour interviews that I have done for 45 years, I found no more than 3% of the United States adults I interviewed had self-esteem. Almost no one in our country loves themselves. So I think a really good start is to love yourself. One good way to love yourself as the doctor is to make sure you do a lot of work for the poor. And because I think Mexico is like the United States. You don't take care of your poor, right? OK, it's embarrassing. I, I'm ashamed, richest country of the world. We don't take care of 50 million of our people. Screw them. So feel good about yourself. But the two, two strategies I did that have really worked for me is one thing that I say is that I dove into the ocean of gratitude and never found the shore. So I live constantly swimming in gratitude. Gratitude for my life, gratitude for my health, gratitude for my partner, my children, gratitude for the arts, for nature, billions of things I'm grateful for. And I never leave that gratitude. I'm swimming in it. You know, woo, yeah, thank you. Because we're in a society that's much more interested in hearing you complain I actually think that if you have food and a friend, what are you bitching about? <laughs> Another thing is that happened to me is that I decided to make me. It was just, you know, you can sit there and you can make choices in your life. Choice to be a doctor, choice to be a pediatrician. I realized that I actually could choose exactly the me I wanted to be. I was going to be happy all the time. Now, the way I can give it as a formula is that that is an intention. I will love life. 
Not I hope to love life. I'll try to love life. I should love life. I could love life. <laughs> I will love life. That's an intention. In the having an intention, I then have an infinite number of possible performances to put that intention forward. And I have the immediate feedback loop of seeing how I did. So I will love life. I will be universally friendly. I will, I will see this child that is dying from third degree burns, screaming in the hor most horrible possible situation. I will be a radiant, loving doctor. I will make me. I'm, I'm going to make me. Same way I can say, I'll raise my right hand, I'll raise my right hand, I'll raise my right hand, I'll raise... Notice I can do that 100% of the time. Who's in charge? Me. And so you can actually, as a laboratory, notice how many times you're being a you that you're not. Okay? As a medical student in first year, you said, I'm never going to be a rude doctor. I'm never going to be nasty to someone in the nursing station because I've got the power of a doctor. And then maybe you notice as a resident you do that one time. So what I'm asking is for you to take a very close look at who you are all the time with your partner. You know, in a way, you have that situation every time you're walking down the street and your eyes meet a fellow citizen on the street. You have many options. It can be nothing, in which case you just walk on. Or you can imagine a public health gesture. Because, you know, the greatest strides in the history of medicine were in public health in the 19th century around sewage and water. That was the most significant advances in health of human health. I think we need a similar thing in the 21st century around mental health. That we have no education, we don't even have an implication that we can be mentally healthy. No psychiatric textbook in the world has one sentence on mental health. And so, if I'm in a horrible situation where it's one, I mean, when we were in Haiti, you just go one cot, there's a horrible situation, the next cot is a horrible situation, the next cot is a horrible situation, and there's a big tent with 120 horrible situations in it. You know, when I think, what is my job as a doctor? What are my, what are my jobs? If I'm going to be a doctor, what does be a doctor mean? There's, for me, the boring part, information, what test disorder, what, what treatments to do, but that isn't being a doctor, that's being a cook. But what is, what is it to be a doctor? You know, do, do you find out the patient's name? Do you hold their hand? Do you, you know, it may have looked like I wasn't a doctor to this woman, but in my holding her and embracing her, I was being a doctor. I think you could see it had a meaning for her. And that's how you know. You look at the consequences of what you do. In pediatrics, children are very good uh, responders. They'll let you know how you're doing. And that you, you know, I'm suggesting that you can work with performance around dying people to where you actually want to be with dying people. When I found out I could go in a room in a hospital that had no pain medicine and maybe stop the pain, every time I was in a poor hospital that didn't have pain medicine, I say, give me your worst patients. I want, you know, this horrible situation, this horrible situation, because I know it's only going to empower me, because what, my life in a doctor is a life in compassion. That's, if you, that's how I'm defining the life in medicine, a life in the expression of compassion with whatever tools you have. And whatever tools you have now, if humanity survives in 40 years, a lot of what I learned isn't relevant today, 40 years later. So whatever you think is true today in that text.
technological and scientific world will be different in 40 years. Maybe so different that you don't recognize anything of what you're going to take when you leave your residency and go out and be a pediatrician. So it's an opportunity for you to find your vulnerable self. When I clown, I rarely cry with patients. As a doctor, I cry many times. I don't say, time to cry. <laughs> I cry. I rarely cry with somebody new. I have a relationship. Their life matters to me. It's a situation where tears flow. And it, again, bonds you to the patient and their families. So I actually want the worst suffering. So much so I want to live with it. I want, by the way, in the 40th year of our project, last September, we broke ground. We are building a hospital, yeah, yeah, yeah. 40 years. So I, I invite myself. That's why I, I tell every audience, I answer my mail. And many times it's just horror story after horror story of what this person's father does to them or what's happened here or... And I'm, that's my job. I want, I'm, I'm here to be with suffering, with love, and with, with my skills. With, because I've been in a lot of conversations, maybe because you're new to medicine, you practice conversations. I never had a God thought in my life, okay? It never, I'd had nothing growing up, and by the time I grew up, it wasn't interesting to me. Didn't make any sense to me. But as a medical st student, I found the power of praying with a patient who was faithful. So I could have just as easily shown you pr pr me praying with patients in Haiti. I have film of that. So I bring every trick. You see me, even though I don't have much of a voice, I sing songs. You know, I, I bring humanity and I want to know them well so I can know which special if they like this poet, if they like this song, our hospital is going to have the record. It's going to have the poet. Is that a long enough answer? <laughs> Don't be shy. Yes, sir. No questions, but it's perfect. Okay, I have no privacy. <laughs> if you ask it, I'm ready. Which one is your favorite movie? And the second one is, uh, when do you know where you found your true love? Because you are really peaceful and funny people, but how do you make the difference when you found your, your patch love? You mean my romance, Susan? Yeah. All right, those are good stories. <laughs> oh, favorite movie. You know, I'm the librarian of Gesundheit, so we I have 7,000 movies. I study films. So last year I went to Spain eight times, so I saw all of Almodovar's movies and all of Bunuel's movies as a beginning. So it's, you know, and I've read a huge amount of literature in my life, so if you said favorite book, it's too much for me. If you ask me about a movie about that's an anti-war movie? I can tell you... Did you see the movie Amelie? Who, who saw Amelie? Okay. If, and who liked Amelie? Damn good movie. Okay. So in the list of 100 movies, let's say Amelie's there for me. What a beautiful story, and the creativity of Jean-Pierre Jeannot, who made the movie. Who has seen Delicatessen? Okay. Have any of you seen his new movie, Mick Max? I think it's even better than Amelie. It is an anti-war movie that... You know, so many of the movies made by the United States are garbage. 
you know, they want to sell a lot of tickets, they have a lot of violence in them, nudity, whatever, and, and yes, people like action movies, whatever that is, but there's very little creativity in it. You don't even have to be an actor anymore, you just have to look like an actor. Micmacs, and I think this, you know, the point I would make about this director is that it looks like he never saw anyone else's movies and he was going to make them exactly the way he wanted to make one. And they're not particularly big budget movies and they're masterpieces. You know, I, I like all of his movies. And if you haven't seen them, they're, they're all wonderful. And I'm the kind of person, I mean, I'm a nerd, okay, so I want to see all of Bergman's films and all of Kurosawa's films, and I, I want to, I want to, so I, I'll tell you what I do, I, I do an hour and a half or more of exercise a day, and I live on very little sleep, so my normal schedule is I go to, I, I go to a, a, uh, to pick a film and do my yoga and weightlifting while watching a movie every, every night that I'm home, starting at midnight or one o'clock. And I, I watch a lot of them. I don't watch very many what I'd call throwaway movies, in the same way I never read John Grisham, because I don't know why I would. Okay, and tell me specifically what you, about this romance thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tell tell your friends. Did, did everybody hear him? No. So tell tell your friends. You can even say it in Spanish if you want. It's my English is not very good, but oh, no, your English I understood perfectly. Really? <laughs> yes. I mean, you want to talk about Susan? Yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I'm saying that you are really a funny and a person that gives love to everybody. But I want to know when Patch knows that he finds his love, his oh, true, true romantic true love. question. Yeah, it's really romantic. But uh, let me ask you this: Are you in love right now? Yeah. <laughs> right here. Yeah, she's the one. All right. What's her name? What's her name? Patty. Patty. <laughs> So you, you would say you are a romantic? Yeah. Look, now's your chance. We okay, married. Forget it. forget it. Okay. You know, I, I uh, in, when I was young, I couldn't get dates with girls. I wanted dates with girls, but I was too weird. I was a nerd, you know, bookworm, and, and I wasn't macho, and I, I was weird. And so I, I thought, you know, with all the advertisements, everything, you, you, the TV almost forces you to come to conclusions. I thought I wasn't attractive, and so I, I just did more weird things and wasn't nerd. <laughs> I've had very few dates with different women. Have I been out with 10 women in my life? I don't. Maybe not. I was married 26 years to Linda. I met her in medical school. She was not a doctor. And I was so innocent. You know, I, I didn't have a lot of experience. Here was a beautiful woman who loved me. I'm not sure I brought any intelligence to the table. And she is a wonderful woman. She wasn't the right woman for me. We immediately started Gesundheit. And so, Gesundheit was so intense. Our first five years together, we didn't even have a date. We lived in this commune doing this insane work, often with patients in our bedroom with us because we didn't have any room. And 
again? You know, I'm really critical of the rural society that gives no education in loving. You heard me say no s medical school in the world teaches compassion. And if your medical school would like to become one, we are ready to invite medical schools to do that and to explore it with them. But even more, well, let's try. Raise your hand if there's something more important than loving. Right. This is 27 years of lecturing, as many as 11 lectures in a day, to probably 30 million people, and maybe 10 people raise their hands. So loving's the most important thing in life everywhere. There's not one school, kindergarten through 12th grade, that teaches one hour in 13 years of the most important thing in life. So we actually have no idea about loving. In fact, the forces that own the world through money and power over have tricked us to think that love is all about feelings. Where if you're good at loving, it's about intelligence. You have an intelligence about loving. Feelings, if anything, are most often the areas of biggest trouble. So I, I, I stayed with Linda a long time. Living in a commune, we were very good for each other, but our relationship moved to being a brother and a sister. And I'm a crazed romantic. I know two hours of love poetry by heart. You know, so I can talk to Susan. And I met Susan and we are now in our 20th year together. She's made me better in every way. There's nothing about me that isn't better because she's in my life that she's the smartest person I ever met. And a political person. I've kept a daily journal every day for 40 years, and so I can go back and talk about, read the first day I met her, and read the evolution, and... <clears throat> you know, for five years, I didn't even tell her I was crazy about her, because, you know, very successful in a lot of things. I was nervous because I didn't really have much in the way of dating experience. I never wanted, now in the last half of my life, I would have a lot easier time having dates than in the first half of my life. And I recognize that. But I'm a person who wants a really deep relationship with one person. And not a lot of men say that. I, I'm one that wants it. I, because it's the one opportunity you can have many, many, many thousands of hours to really explore a human being. And to show you the weirdness of our relationship, our first four and a half years, I saw her only two days a season, eight days a year. That was for four and a half years. The next four years, I saw her two days a month. So, in our first nine years together, we saw each other 120 days, maybe. But it was so great that next June, in our 20th year, we're moving in with each other. All right. So, you know, in a way, the same thing I mentioned to this woman about intention, performance, and consequences. I'm going to be crazy in love with her every day. I'm never going to get complacent or routine. Four years ago, we started tango lessons, and we're hot. <laughs> so I think with romance, reading books, studying, talking with people, and really Asking yourself, especially as a man, do I want it? To women, most men appear to put money and power over before romance. And so you have to know where you are in that process. I'm a lot better with Susan than I was with Linda. 
because I, in a way, because we get no education in relationships, the lab is our relationship. And when, especially men are young, all of the messages are that you don't have a relationship, you have sex. As much as it, with as many people as you possibly can, and that that makes, that defines you as a successful man. Not that you are a romantic, crazy in love with Patty. Patty? Okay. So, so I, you want to hear a great love poem? Okay. Now, I, I know a lot of Neruda's poetry in English, and I'm going to let, since you would never read it in English, you'll read it in Spanish, you will hear it in English and understand why I hope it's that good in Spanish. Okay, he wrote a hundred love sonnets to his wife, Matilda. This is number 16. In the Patch Adams movie, they misquote number 17. This is number 16. You don't have to translate this. Forget the Spanish, okay? Go to your library. <laughs> this is number 16. And you can hold her hand if you want to and get... <laughs> get a, yeah, okay, right. Look in the eye while I say this. I love the handful of the earth you are. Because of its meadows vast as a planet, I have no other star. You are my replica of the multiplying universe. Your wide eyes are the only light I know from extinguished constellations. Your skin throbs like a streak of a meteor through rain. Your hips were that much of the moon for me, your deep mouth and its delights, that much sun. Your heart, fiery with its long red rays, was that much ardent light like honey in the shade, so I pass across your burning form, <laughs> kissing you, compact and planetary, my dove my globe. It's nice in English, isn't it? Real nice in English. I know many of his love poems, and all love poems are understatements, you know, in a way, and if you really want to explore it in your life, be a man who talks about romance. Be a man who wants to explore that with a person. That, uh, Let's move away from men thinking women are sex objects. Because if you turn on that TV, women are jiggling breasts. And that's embarrassing. So you are the pioneer for this romance stuff. Write me, I'll give you some pointers. <laughs> Remember intention, I will be romantic. So every single day the rest of your life when you wake up together, you let her see it's the greatest moment of your life. Every time. And it's not a bunch of romantic hooey. If you live from intention, you make it each day. Yeah. <laughs> and these next 10 slides will be Susan. Yes, somebody else, yes. But I, I believe... Yes, do I need Spanish? Yeah, I, will, I really believe that there is a connection between uh, human health and I is how many times here in the hospital, how can any of us make uh, to one patient, to one boy, the most uh, perfect and wonderful moment with one joke, one caca, one moco. But how can we make... Uh, he is, uh, the um, way that he lives, his sickness, uh, his pain, the change with, with the humor. How can we make that the old, old here, the, they are living with sickness. How can we change the way that 
the, the person live with the sickness. Well, if you start in the hospital, even though it's a very serious situation, you see that there can be pleasure. And if you make house calls, that's a place where you can show that it can happen in the home. If you were a pediatrician who saw a need for this in their practice, maybe one day a month for all interested parents and their children, you would have a picnic of exploring play. You could invite, I know there are clown groups in most of the big cities in Mexico. Invite them in, do it yourself. You could, uh, I mean, before, before a family has a child, you can talk about nutrition, you can talk about all sorts of things, and you can talk about play. You can make your office a place a child looks forward to going. We're going to the doctor's office? Great! Because they know there's toys and fun there. And that you, you invite that ethic instead of, you know, I'm the doctor. Yes, what's your problem? I see. Very interesting. We will order these tests. These have these results. Good luck. See you in a week. You know, that's a style. So I think as you, as you make an offering of, the, of a vision, you could go to, you know, if you were a crazy pediatrician, you could go to high schools and, and have little clown clubs and have those clown clubs have groups of people that visit your patients that now need someone to go to their house. I mean, you do a person a favor to get them to turn off their TV. I hate TV, ladies and gentlemen. Worst invention of the 20th century. It's made us stupid. It's made us uninterested in things. So please, turn off your TV. So that's, you know, the beautiful thing about thinking and also the position you will have as a doctor because, you know, it's, I'm really glad I'm a doctor, okay? I don't, maybe don't look like a doctor, but a huge of things can happen because I'm a doctor. So a doctor could go, you could say, I saw this guy, Patch Adams, you know, the movie, show it to some high school students, and then you have a little brigade of 20 students that work in pairs that go and have a weekend visit to the patients you suggest that they do. Before you know it, those high school students are thinking about going into social work or medicine or theater or something that you, you look for you look for that possibility that you you see it is valuable i mean i'm sitting here thinking i would like peace on earth and i don't have there's no time in history there was peace so you don't have a model but you you try something you you think about your colleagues maybe maybe you think about big pediatric ward one wing will be a playful goofy loving non-hierarchical ward Okay, and, and you say it's going to be experimental because you can get lots of data, okay, lots of reports saying this is valid to try that. And then your ward becomes that, and then the people that work there, uh, I mean, I know they have this profession, I really laugh at the name child life specialist, <laughs> playmate, child life specialist. And that. You could start an atmosphere on the ward, and I think a lot of the Starlight people and the Make-A-Wish Foundation, there are lots of people trying to do this in pediatrics. Hopefully you want it to leak over into the adult wards also. And that you just say, if it isn't there, I'm going to pioneer it. You understand that, right? Because there are ways, you just find ways. I mean, when we started being goofy in hospitals 40 years ago, nobody was doing it in the world. And now there are clown groups even arguing the right way to do it, the wrong way to do it. <laughs> so, you know, become experimental, be yourself a playful person. 
I mean, you're pediatricians, so that gives you freedom to be goofy. You can say, well, normally I'm a serious person, but I'm a pediatrician, so I play with the children. <laughs> and, uh, and just start doing it everywhere. If you log, to make that step to being a playful person all the time, you just, again, you have a total ticket as a pediatrician. You're doing it for the good of your patients. I would never do this stuff except for the good of my patients. So if you're in a grocery store, play with the kids. Wherever you are, find yourself injecting. Because you don't know in that grocery store who just found out their child has leukemia. You don't know. And you're, you're going to have an impact. How are we doing? Questions? Yes, ma'am. And be sure to tell me when you need me to get the Spanish assistance. What's that? La, project your voice. Pat, did you believe in God? Well, I could say, are you, have you been listening? <laughs> Because the people who listen know I've already answered that question, but I'm glad you asked it. Because sometimes it's hard to believe. Never in my life once did I have a thought about God. When I grew up, my parents weren't religious. And when I came back to the country, Christian United States, and saw that they denied rights to black people, I knew they were fake. You know, you study what the Catholic Church did to the native people of North and South America. So I'm, it's never, it's never been interesting to me. I can't imagine heaven or hell. I can't imagine most of the things connected to religions. And religions as organizations have been, have a very horrible history in humanity and a very horrible one currently. I can tell you this, I've prayed with thousands of patients, especially in Latin America, it has a strong, especially the poor, that have a strong connection to Christ and, and Mary. And so, you know, I, sh I could show you a film. I, I pray with the deepest sincerity you know, I take what's sincere to me, simply it comes out translated, because, you know, as I can quote Neruda, I can quote the Bible. But I see it as powerful medicine. And I recommend to all of you doctors who do not use it, especially in pediatrics, if a family's child is dying, I mean, I could tell you maybe one of the most emotional stories of my clown life that happened in Ecuador with a a family and and they had a strong faith and you saw the faith carried them through so I completely see the importance of faith so what I, I what I found out when I was a third year student in the emergency room again I remember a lot of times you remember the first time thing happens I remember exactly this family in the emergency brought in their dead child, died from an accident. There's no pill you can take. There's no magic word of comfort. And I saw in their bracelet that they were Baptist, which is a kind of Christian. And I said, do you mind if we pray? I got down on my knees. I put my hands together and I gave beautiful poetry about their child going to live with Christ and lots of beautiful language around eternity and how they, he will be preparing the, the world for them when they die and come to them. And the family wrote me for 10 years after that. And many have done it since. And from that day, what, I, what has been important for me and part of that four-hour interview with a patient is for them to tell me their relationship to their God. 
and if they like a particular Swami, I read the book of the Swami. So when I'm with a Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist. When I'm with an atheist, I'm an atheist. When I'm with a person who likes the Beatles, I like the Beatles. If they like, it doesn't matter to me. Whatever you like, whatever is a power for you, I become that power. And, and with sincerity, because I take what I hold sincere and translate, much as the interpreter is translating my English to Spanish. Because it is a great force. It just, uh, it hasn't hit me yet. There are lots of hands. Yes, sir. What? How do you start? How do you start with the patient? There are, uh, I mean, there are, there are a very lot of different personalities. You walk to the, I don't know, if you see a patient in the chair, and you see something like, oh, and some things are smiling, and some one are, I don't, I don't know. How do you start with Okay, that's right. People want you to say that in English into a microphone so the interpreter can say it in Spanish. <laughs> Lo digo en español. <laughs> que cómo empieza? Si hay diferentes tipos de personalidades, ¿cómo, cómo, puede, cómo puede diferenciar alguna de otra y empezar con, con, con las personalidades diferentes de cada persona? Okay, if he told you the same thing he told me. <laughs> I mean, I think, again, if you enter the field of medicine, they don't do it in medical school, but it would be beautiful if they spent a month with students where they just said, who are you? Who are you as a person? What does it mean to be a doctor? What, what is, is there a personality of a doctor? Are there personalities of a doctor that you choose in order to enhance the beauty of your practice of medicine? And I would say yes. I, uh, I invite you again to go to our website and see there I have put up there that we will be implementing at medical schools who want it to explore what compassion is. So how can you go into medicine if you don't love people? Are you, I mean, in the United States, you could be honest and say, I'm going in it for the prestige, the security, and the money. OK, and some of you, if you were honest, would probably answer with those things. But let's say you're the romantic type, and you went into medicine to help people. What never helps people? Nastiness, rudeness, unkindness. OK, that never helps people. So you're never going to do it. OK, whether you're going to be a doctor or a clown, here's my class. Twinkle in the eye, okay, have a twinkle. Everybody twinkle, twinkle, sparkle, sparkle in your eyes, sparkle, 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 sparkle. And what happens when your eyes sparkle? You smile, twinkle in your eyes, smile on your face, and a willingness to greet. So, I mean, I recommend never being hierarchical. So if they're sitting, sit down with them. Ideally, get rid of the white coat. Uh, figure that one out. Um, that you, you decide that you're going to be a person interested in people. They say the average doctor interrupts the patient interview within 20 seconds. Relax. Unless they have an arterial bleed. You know, and, and learn to read people. You know, we're so dominated by written word that we don't know that there are other things to read. So a Native American could, if four people were walking through the woods, could follow them through the woods and show you constantly how they're reading their walk through the woods. You understand what I'm saying? 
when you walk on an elevator, when I walk on an elevator, I can tell in many cases if the person is hurting. You know, but hopefully in medicine you are learning the language of humanity. Charles Darwin, in one of his lesser known books, says that all over the world anger has the same face. You know, that, that when you show people faces, angry face, happy face, that wherever you go in the world they say, that's happy, that's angry. So you can start reading a person. So you, you walk in a room and, and you try to have a knowledge, the difference between teenagers and grandmothers, or within teenagers, many kinds of teenagers. And that you, maybe this is where it's important for a doctor to study the arts, to study psychology, to to go out and, you know, when I had medical students, when our hospital was open, and I had uh, medical students come and take a month elective with me, I would take them to a park and say you have a half hour to get a dinner invitation. Almost all of the training I did is for medical students was to teach them to fall in love with people. I, now, we do a humanism in medicine elective in October, People come from all over the world to it, and I, I, I get a huge amount of letters from people who are hurting. And I give them to people and say, how would you answer this letter? You know, what, how, what do you have to show with your humanity? Okay, if you have a white coat, do you have a toy in it? In pediatrics, who has a toy in their pocket? You're in pediatrics. Raise your and if you have a toy in your pocket, unless you'll get in trouble for raising your hand. <laughs> How can you be in pediatrics and not have a toy in your pocket for crying out loud? Inconceivable to me. So you, you, you start, you know, when I, when I made those phone calls to people, after I'd made a thousand phone calls, you can imagine I was better. So you actually pr practice engaging people to understand what does this look mean? When can you tell that a patient is lying? What is the posture you can have where they will want to tell you the truth? You understand what I'm saying? How can you treat them as an equal, even if they're a bum on the street, smelling of alcohol, with clearly their life is shit? How can, you be, how can you decide to be equal with that person? You know, as, uh, to the person who asked the, the God question, I mean, Christ was washing feet. You know, are you ready to wash feet and to... You know, when our hospital was open, the patients saw me clean the toilets, wash the dishes, work in the garden, but you you share, what part of your humanity can you share? Can you, I know it's not right for a doctor to share some of themselves in a history, but that's a bunch of garbage. You know, to be human with another human being and to be interested. So that if you're not interested in kids that are skateboarders, go where skateboarders are playing and practice talking with skateboarders. But you, you understand. I wrote 300 men who were on death row because they were murderers and are going to be executed in the United States so that I can understand murderers. But you, you're in medicine, which means you're in the study of people. And unfortunately in medical school, you studied their organs. You didn't study their faces. And so now become an educated person. So, so you walk in a little, you're hungry, you're walking in a place, and you look around and say, who's the person? There's no way I would see if I could sit and have lunch with them. And then you say, hey, can I have lunch with you? But you, you practice being comfortable with humanity. And after you do it a while, you will, f you know, if you find that you indeed love humanity, you'll never get enough. 
You'll never get enough. You'll be curious. You'll also, you can go at a party. You're a young person now. You probably go to parties. You can look around and say, who is not connected at this party? See if you can pick out people that are on an antidepressant. You know, just see, just start saying, what languages am I learning? You know, you can watch a party, how people maneuver around the party, how, you know, can you, how quickly can you notice the people that don't know anybody at the party? Play with those things. What, what has been your worst experience with anger or with someone that doesn't want to joke or how did you uh, uh, get to connect with people? Someone who has been suffering a lot and is very angry with his or her disease and doesn't want to laugh. Can you raise your hand? I didn't see yes. who's asking I'm that short. question. <laughs> I'm you? Short. Yes. Wait, who? <laughs> oh, okay. This person I thought raised their hand. so. I Great, thank you. You know, when you s said, what makes you angry, I immediately thought my government. <laughs> you know, the United States, number one terrorist nation, murdered a million people. My anger for national corporations and for governments. You know, an angry, let's take an angry. You know, I worked in a lot of prisons. There's a lot of anger in prisons. There's, you know, there's a lot of in my gender because the education for my gender is money and power. You quickly realize only a few are at the top. You also quickly realize how much you like another man to boss you around. And you notice that in growing up, you are spending your lifetime being bossed around by men. Yeah, you're trying to end this, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to guess this is my last question. Is okay, great. So ending at five is an Okay, great. So in the most anger I've seen patients have been people that my profession would label psychotic. Okay, the mentally ill. I don't like any psychiatric diagnosis. They have no basis in data. My closest friend in medical school was murdered by one of our patients. This was a quietly angry man. He used to walk up to staff and patients in our hospital, grab their head, and go, I'm going to kill you. We were also the doctors for the largest motorcycle gang in the United States. And they love being angry. Angry is fun. You know, I come from a very angry nation. I'm surrounded by anger. You know, it's so embarrassing to be from the United States. I wish I could burn my passport. You know, anger, anger is so prevalent. You know, we, we have such poor skills at human relations. People are on edge. The economic situations are rough. So I have a lot of forgiveness for individual anger. I'm shocked women aren't unbelievably angry given the lousiness of the history. You know, no country was ever safe to its women. Ever in history, no country. So, you know, I've been spit at and we allowed a lot of patients in our home that were angry, unmedicated. We did not give psychotic people. We had one rule, no physical violence. You could stand naked on the dining room table yelling dirty words and we would find it and create a theater piece around it. <clears throat> but physically violent, that instant you had to leave no matter what. I have to change. I have to change. 
Which one am I changing? Oh, it's this one you want to change. You change it, and I'll keep talking. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Uh-oh. Not connecting to the trans interpreter. Let's give the interpreter a big hand. She's working very hard. Yay! Ah, <laughs> I'll tell you something. I didn't know I had anger until I had children. <laughs> I, I have been a very unangry person. But then I learned that you tell them, you, at least for me and my children, I said, this is a really good time for you to be in your room. You know, I'm, I'm not a hitting person. I would not defend my family. I am a completely nonviolent person. I know that there's a huge amount of anger in the world. I've been thinking an interesting thought about the emotions that I haven't heard anyone else say. If you've heard of evolutionary psychology and the idea that maybe love developed as an actually evolutionary tool so that a group, which is what we've been for a hundred million years, could get along. It makes sense. Because there's nothing that keeps two people together like friendship. I've been thinking that maybe the emotions are the sense organs for the mind. That there aren't good emotions and bad emotions, there are emotions, and if they're really big like anger, pay attention, it's telling you something. So, it makes sense for me to be really angry with Bush and Cheney. Now I'm angry at Obama. Okay, because they're murdering people for money. You, you know, it's so easy, often, when we had angry people, we had many angry people come to our place. We played tricks, right? We were free. We were free and we fed you. And we loved you. So, I might give a signal and a big, tough, angry motherfucker would be in there and we'd give a little signal and six people would go hug him and not let go. And I'd be there standing like the doctor going, what were you saying again? Uh, so you, you, it's improvisation. You work in, in, I think in all human relations, you bring the intelligence of everything you thought before. What have you done? Now if you've got two kids fighting, there's a wonderful trick, okay? Johnny is coming up here and Billy is coming up saying, he hit me, he hit me first, he hit me. And there's no way to win that for an adult, okay? So here's what I would do, I'd become very slow and say, okay, now tell me again, Johnny, what happened? He hit me, okay, did he hit you with his right hand or his left hand? Okay, fine. Was it balled up like this? And you just drag it out really a long time before they say, I'm getting out of here. And that's... Okay, another little secret, and I'm sorry to use technology. Oops, wrong technology. Dr. Fart. Or Dr. Pedo, I think. Okay, so let's say I've got a big angry man there. 
really angry, but there's a moment of silence. And you just try it, okay? Your hand's in your pocket. He thinks you farted. He doesn't know you have technology on your side. And so, you know, we used a lot of tricks. It, was a, it, it, it wasn't a normal looking hospital. There was, there was food, you know, so we could say, look, why don't you stay for dinner? And a lot of times, angry people don't, in this case, they walk in a place, they're just angry, and they know from all the other times they brought anger to a place that it made it very uncomfortable. And so a lot of us would march right up and be comfortable and act like, you know, the anger was their thing. I actually would rather them be horribly angry than paralyzingly depressed. The the really depressed or anxious person is much more complicated. The, the angry person is mostly easy to diffuse. If they're on, I mean, there was a popular drug among, especially among angry men, PCP, angel dust. And there were times we just had to ask them to leave. Because you, you could not hit another person. But you can be anything. They can be their angry self and you're going, oh, I see you're angry. And you could act very scientific, a lot like I did for the children, go, oh, I see now, what's bothering you? You know, I see you're angry. Oh, I see. And then you just make it a very long story, and before you know it, you're sitting down, they're sitting down, and you can say things, do you mind if I rub your feet? I've been studying some reflexology. <laughs> and maybe you're not studying reflexology, it doesn't matter. But you just make offerings, and you kill them with kindness. You're far enough away, it's hard for me to see how you're responding, but wait, you, your hand was going up, so there's an addendum. Yes. Oh, okay. So you didn't. I mean, what you're hearing me say with a lot of these questions is, use your intelligence. Feel free to explore. Make sure you're safe as a woman. Make sure that you're safe. And, I mean, some people are angry and they're in a particular mental state that they're going to kill people. And for us, we didn't let them stay at our place. And that everybody else, over time, would start to soften, usually over a short period of time. And if they went through the softening process there once, and you knew what worked, you could make it much shorter the next time to where eventually they just wouldn't use the anger there. They would see that it's not a, it's not a thing that, that serves a purpose. A lot of people use anger, particularly in hierarchical situations, because no one listens to them unless they're angry. Tick, 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 boom! Is that it? You've had enough? Right here in the second row. Oh, in Spanish. I am there with you. No problem. I speak perfect Spanish. ¿Ahí me escucha? ¿Ahí me escucha? ¿Me escucha ahí? ¿Hable? ¿Me escucha ahí? No. Okay. You, you speak Spanish. Sorry, I can't hear him. The mic is off or I don't know. Okay. Yeah? Okay. You can't hear his microphone. Okay. Why don't... Uh, we're going to get very experimental. Okay. Everything is working. Escucha usted? Speak Spanish. <laughs> 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 
español. <risa> Ante todo, eh, le agradezco porque nos ha estado dando esta plática. Me gustaría mencionarle la siguiente frase que francamente se me hace eh, óptima para este, este caso. Que el tiempo es insignificante, más el momento es una eternidad de un, de un instante. Perdón. Eh, más aparte, una pregunta. Una pregunta. ¿Cómo trata usted a los pacientes con una depresión crónica? En su clínica principalmente. How do I treat chronically depressed people? One of the things that is controversial, that is of an opinion I give very strongly is depression is never an illness. I'm going to say that again because it may be the first time you heard it. Depression is never an illness. It is a pharmaceutical company diagnosis. Depression is a symptom of loneliness. You cannot be depressed and have the conscious dancing of a friend in your head at the same time. You have to push out your God, push out your friends, push out nature, and then you can call the loneliness depression, and then the doctor can say you have depression and give you a pill. So, 20th century literature all over the world is about loneliness, meaninglessness and loneliness. I found, when I did the four hour interviews, I found most Americans were lonely. If we really sat down and we really talked with each other, you know, and I'd ask them, if you lost everything, who would take you in joyfully? And a lot of people didn't have anybody. I actually think loneliness is the worst experience a human can have. You can see people laughing, enjoying themselves in Haiti right after the earthquake. You can see people, you know, right after the tsunami in Sri Lanka, people could laugh and enjoy if they were with friends. But depression you can have if you're rich, you have everything, you can still be depressed. Because if we've been communal for a hundred million years, that's in our genetic makeup. And so when we feel unconnected, that is when we panic. If you watch other group animals, like a meerkat is a one that's, I know, been on TV. But these animals, they live as a group. They don't live by themselves. And in a world that worships money and power over, there's no sense, especially in us men, that we can be vulnerable around loving, vulnerable around friendship. We're supposed to be strong. I don't need you. And what a horrible lie to live. It's very interesting. No one who ever came depressed by medical terms at our hospital was depressed after 24 hours. Nobody. Huge amounts of hugging, huge amounts of play, huge amounts of engagement and working together. They forgot it. So a patient would come to me and say, Doctor, I'm depressed all the time. 
Okay, it's a common hyperbole. So, okay, I want to finish this because many of you have gone through depression. It's loneliness. Reach out, hold friends. So there were times I held people for 10 hours in my arms, in my arms, saying I love you, playing jokes. I would invite other people to hug with me. 10 hours. It didn't matter to me until they relaxed in my arms and felt that I really loved them. I wasn't going to let go. And that we have to face the truth that we cannot stand alone. We need our friends. You know that. Do you know that yet? Do you know that you need friends? Well, you're saying that like maybe not, but I'll say yes because he's standing up there. <laughs> Well, if you don't think you do, you're lucky. You haven't found out yet just how much you do. We desperately need human connections. When we, these people in the United States who walk in a post office and kill 20 people, they're lonely. You have to be lonely to be able to do that. We have to be a group. We have to have, have at least one friend or we cannot be mentally healthy. An occasional person can get it with God. But even people who love God and God lives in their life, most of them still need a human friend. And so we loved our patients. We I would handcuff them to me. I'm depressed all the time. I would handcuff them to me. And we would go through the day, and during the course of the day, I could show them 200 times they're not depressed. But they're saying, I'm depressed all the time. So I would trick them and take them to cute little puppies and we would get down and the puppies would be going you'd see them happy enjoying themselves and I would say is this one of those depressed all the time moments <coughs> and that's it was around mental illness that it was most important that our hospital was open we were a sanctuary a playground a place to be loved People who had no friends, if they had a birthday, would bring a cake and ice cream, and they know that we would stop everything to have a party for them. That uh, it didn't mean if they stopped being depressed there that they couldn't go home and be depressed. It really proves a point. You have to have a friend. And you can have thousands. You can have thousands. You have to have at least one. Okay, I think that I've gone a half hour over my time, right? Thank you very much.